Hello, this is uh, Barry Shaw, and this is The View from Israel. Now, this uh, video is going to be very interesting to quite a lot of you, because we'll be talking about something you've heard about constantly, the constant drumbeat of illegally occupying territory, as it applies to Israel. Well, we're going to talk about illegally occupying territory, but it's not going to be by Israel. And I think you'll find it uh, this uh, show interesting, curious, and we'd like you to share it. And to help me on this, I've got a special guest. Her name is Naomi Khan. Naomi, welcome to The View from Israel. Thanks for inviting me. Right. Uh, Naomi, I understand that you are the international director for Regavim. Um, tell us who Regavim is, what organization, what do they do? So Rigavim is a non-profit, a non-government organization that was founded almost 16 years ago. The very basic questions that we deal with are legislation and uh, this legal application of the Zionist vision as it refers to land use throughout the land of Israel. That includes Judea and Samaria, and it includes uh, everywhere within what we call here Little Israel the Negev, the Galilee, Jerusalem, the central, the coastal plain, everywhere. Who's making decisions about who uses the land uh, and who's enforcing those decisions? That's what, essentially what Rigavim uh, has carved out for itself. And we've become recognized as the foremost experts um, on land use policy and land law in Israel. Let me start with a little location called Kal and Alama. Explain to us where Kal Alama is, where it's located, and why it could be considered as being illegally occupied. I'd, I'd also like to thank you for actually uh, bringing up this particular case because we consider Khan al Ahmar to be the flagship case of a much larger phenomenon that we are battling in Judea and Samaria. Following the the launch of a very clear and highly celebrated Palestinian Authority, I would call it a, a doctrine, but it's more than a doctrine, it's an actual plan, that was launched in 2009. That is the Fayyad Plan. Now, anyone who's interested can look it up on the internet. The official name for this plan was called Ending the Occupation and Establishing the State. In 2009, the man who was then Prime Minister of the Palestinian Authority, Salam Fayyad, announced that the Oslo process was over. What he said was, the Oslo process will not bring us the state that we want or deserve, and we will therefore now go about creating the state of Palestine unilaterally. Now, this, of course, um, abrogates international treaty, international law, because the Oslo Accords are actually the legal framework that is still in force in these areas. Uh, but what was worse was that it, it essentially placed the situation uh, in a one-sided framework. And uh, the state of Israel to this very day, and we're talking about from 2009 till 2022, has made believe that the Fayyad plan was never announced, that it wasn't launched, that it didn't, doesn't exist, that the Palestinian Authority is not carrying it out, and that the European Union has not adopted this as the working plan for the, uh, for the way forward. And so the state of Israel continues to uh, close its eyes and ignore the changes on the ground, whereas the European Union publicly adopted the Fayyad plan soon after its launch and has been assisting the Palestinian Authority in carrying it out ever since. And the flagship case uh, for all of this really is crystallized in the case of Khan al Ahmar. Shalom, Kanishami Tmat Regavim. Mehachorai Khan al Ahmar, Male Adumim, and Kvish Mispara Khat, and Movili Rushalayim. La Khona, Khan al Ahmar al Tala Kotorot. La Sibai, Sak Din Shel Bagats, Shemeh Afshir Lamdina Levatse, Savea Risa, Shomdin Kvara Srochenim, Meala Mahazalo Hukiaz. 
חאן אל-אחמר הוא בעצם מאחז לא חוקי שהוקם בסוף שנות ה-90. לפניו, בסוף שנות ה-70, היו פה מספר אוהלים בודדים ומספר נפדים שהסתובבו פה במרחב, אבל בסוף שנות ה-90 החל המאחז להתקבע. כל זה בסיוע של הרשות הפלסטינית והאיחוד האירופי. בואו נדבר קצת על תא השטח שנמצא מאחוריי. כביש מספר 1 מוביל מירושלים לים המלח, מכונה גם E1. הרשות הפלסטינית והאיחוד האירופי פועלים להקים עשרות נקודות יישוב לא חוקיות ואלפי מבנים, החל מדרום הר חברון ועד צפון השמרון. המטרה היא פשוטה, השתלטות על תא שטח, קביעת עובדות בשטח והתכתבות ברורה עם תוכנית פיאד, שמשמעותה יצירת רצף טריטוריאלי בין בית לחם, דרך רמאללה ועד ג'נין. חאן אל-אחמר הוא מאחז הדגל, ולכן כל המאמץ התקשורתי, ההסברתי והמשפטי מרוכז בו. חשוב לומר, אותם תושבים שגרים פה לא גרים במיקום הטוב ביותר, ההפך, הם גרים במיקום מסוכן, מטרים בודדים מכביש סואן. התושבים הם בעצם פיונים של הרשות הפלסטינית והאיחוד האירופי בדרך להשיג את המטרה הגדולה של השתלטות על אזור E1. לעומת זאת, מדינת ישראל, לפנים משורת הדין, השקיעה מיליוני שקלים בהכשרת מגרשים באבו דיס, ובעצם נותנת לאותם תושבים פתרון מגורים טוב בהרבה מהמצב הקיים. אלא שעכשיו... האיחוד האירופי והרשות הפלסטינית שבנו באופן לא חוקי מפעילות לחץ אגרסיבי על מדינת ישראל שלא תאכוף את החוק. בדיוק כמו נתיב האבות, עמונה, מגרון, שם נאכף החוק עד המטר האחרון. גם כאן מדינת ישראל צריכה לעמוד ולאכוף את החוק בצורה הברורה ביותר. אכיפת חוק ברורה תהווה גם מסר למדינות אירופה. די להתערב בענייני הפנים של מדינת ישראל. So we saw all of this, and we decided to prosecute the case of Khan al-Ahmad. We went to court to try to block, um, to, to try to get a decision, uh, and to force the state of Israel to take action against this illegal outpost. Again, we have nothing against the people who live there. Um, the people who live there are actually extremely unfortunate. They are pawns. Um, and the Palestinian Authority in the Fayyad plan, when it was launched, the, the, the Prime Minister Fayyad actually announced that the Bedouin would be used uh, as the foot soldiers for Palestinian independence. This was a declaration uh, that has been actually uh, an extremely effective tactic because the Bedouin are an extremely vulnerable, semi-mobile uh, population. Uh, with no real voice in any government and no one looking out for them. So the Palestinian Authority places them and uses them to help gain control over strategic points on the map. And that's exactly the, the full story of Khan al-Ahmed. Through six different rounds of Supreme Court hearings and cases, uh, each of which have proven beyond a doubt that this is uh, not, it's not in the best interest of these Bedouin to be living on a highway uh, without sewage and running water. The state of Israel created an alternative location for their relocation on Israeli state land, even though these are not Israeli citizens. This Palestinian Authority and a host of European concerns and the European Union itself went to court to force the Bedouin not to take any step toward a compromise with the state of Israel. and not to relocate, and forces them, under threat of actual violence, to stay on this illegal location in order to give the Palestinian Authority a foothold in this strategic area. That's the story of Khan al-Akhman. You know, Naomi, I visited uh, Khan al-Akhman oh, about a few years ago. In fact, I had uh, two field tours there um, given to me by Ari Briggs at that time. He, he told me at the time uh, that the land was part, as we said, were part of Area C, which is under, uh, officially under Israeli control, both administratively and security-wise, according to the Oslo Accord. So Israel is doing nothing illegal at, uh, on this time until until there will be a permanent peace agreement between Israel and the Palestinians, the Palestinian Authority, in which perhaps part of that will talk about division of the land or, or having dual population or some other. Depends how an agreement is reached with the Palestinians 
and it may not be strictly a question of land. This is our land move out. There are possibilities where, uh, as I've had in a, a, a previous video, where part of the agreement could be with the Palestinians in areas that are both Jews and Arabs, that the Arabs will be Palestinian, the Jews will be Israeli. The other thing I wanted to point out about this is that at the time, Ari pointed out to me that a lot of the people who were living in the, 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 the prefabricated buildings had been deliberately transferred in by the Palestinian Authority from other areas under their control, as agreed by the, uh, the Oslo Accord, and move them in. That is not only illegal occupation, but it's also done by officially transferring populations from one place to the other, which again is against international law. Uh, people who have permanent residences in areas A and B to move into area C. It gives them tax breaks, it gives them licensing uh, breaks, it gives them all sorts of cash payments to move into areas in area C uh, and to stay there in order to gain control of the land resource. This happens all through Area C. Um, we find it particularly in the Gush Etzion area, in the Southern Hebron Hills area. People who have registered residences, and I'm not talking about shacks, I'm talking about permanent brick and mortar, large family homes in Bedouin towns like Yata and Baninaim and all these other uh, Arab towns in the area. The Palestinian Authority gives them incentives, gives them building materials in many, many cases, and encourages them to build illegally with European support uh, in Area C. And the Israeli government is all too often faced with international pressure uh, when it comes to uh, demolish illegal structures. Uh, there's a massive system of pressure on the state of Israel, uh, tremendous propaganda, um, public relations, massive uh, quote-unquote humanitarian aid is poured into creating all new villages uh, that are peopled by uh, either Bedouin or other residents of areas under Palestinian Authority control. All through Area C, we are seeing uh, population transfer by the Palestinian Authority. As a matter of fact, when the Trump plan was still on the table, the Prime Minister of the Palestinian Authority announced a system of cash payments and other benefits for anyone who would be willing to move into the Jordan Valley area, also considered Area C, uh, and to help change the demographics of the area so that they could help block the Trump plan's uh, changing lines of jurisdiction, because uh, part of the Trump plan was to give Israel sovereignty over the Jordan Valley. So they targeted, the Palestinian Authority targeted that area by pushing populations, uh, Arab and Bedouin populations, to move into those areas uh, to, take, to, to change the demographic balance. This is definitely a phenomenon. And yes, um, the Bedouin are the most easily manipulated and therefore the, the pawns, really, in many, many of these Palestinian Authority land grabs. Well, you raised a very interesting point. You talked about Mahmoud Abbas offering cash payments to transfer uh, into uh, Area C which is again against the Oslo Accord. I want to ask you a direct question. Has the Israeli government ever offered Israelis cash payments to move them into areas A or B? There are absolutely never, ever any attempts by the Israeli government or by Israeli individuals or by settlers or by anyone else ever to move Jewish populations into area A or B. Areas A and B are, and for want of a better term, I know this is very jarring to some people, but areas A and B are Judenrein. They are devoid of Jews 
by act of the international community. But Jordan and the areas under Jordanian occupation illegally for those 19 years between 1948 and 1967 are uh, Judenrein. And now, according to some in the international community and to the Palestinian Authority, they are demanding essentially that that immoral, racist um, cleansing of Jews be completed and enshrined in law in the last remaining portion of the areas illegally occupied by Jordan until 1967, which is now today known as Area C, is the only remaining portion of uh, Judea and Samaria that is still uh, under Israeli jurisdiction of any kind, although it is not part of sovereign Israel. So there's an absurdity involved here, and that is that this ethnic cleansing and racial discrimination that would not be accepted anywhere else in the world is actually in full force here and supported by the international community and in some strange ways and some strange cases is actually enforced by the government of Israel against Jews. I will tell our, um, our viewers um, and those who have been there will corroborate what I'm saying. You, if you want to go down to the Dead Sea from Jerusalem, you go down the road, you go past, actually go past Carmel on the right hand side before you get to Malay Adumim or the other way around. But you go down all the way to the Dead Sea, the, the turn off of Jericho is on the left. And before you arrive at the Dead Sea, there's quite a nice, uh, interesting cafe, large cafe over there on the right hand side that I usually stop at. Uh, and um, I want to tell you, on a couple of times I've gone down to the Dead Sea and sometimes gone into it like that way. When I stopped at that cafe, I parked right next to cars. Some of the cars have been better than mine uh, with Palestinian number plates. However, before then, there are roads that have Israeli government sign saying this is forbidden for Israelis to go, for Israeli drivers to go past this point. I think you can corroborate that with for me. Well, that is certainly, um, I, I like to take people as I drive through E1 and uh, up to Abu Dis and, and all the uh, areas in, in, in that region, and I show them the signs, and then we stand under the signs, the, the, the big red signs say that not that it is forbidden, because that is not actually um, a part of the Oslo Accords. What it says is, that it is dangerous, and it is indeed dangerous. Israeli drivers, but I don't mean Israeli drivers, what I really mean is Jewish drivers, any Jews who wander into these places by accident uh, risk their lives. And we've had situations of lynchings and um, very, very unpleasant things if Jews actually wander into areas under Palestinian authority control. Um, on the other hand, yes, uh, drive all through the area. I like to stand underneath the red sign, for example, that is on the junction between Malay Adumim and Abu Dis. There's a big red sign there that says uh, it's dangerous. This, this area is under Palestinian Authority control and is dangerous for Israelis to enter. But I stand there and I show people the license plates of the cars going in and out of Abu Dis. And they see that it's approximately 50% Palestinian license plates and 50% Israeli license plates. And I ask them, why do you think this is? Are these people trying to get themselves killed? And the answer is very, very clear. The sign is actually a lie. The, the signs are there to warn off Jews and not to warn off Israelis because the Israeli license plates that are going in and out are on cars that are owned by Israeli Arabs and they can go wherever they want. And they can go into Abu Dis and any of the other areas controlled by the Palestinian Authority with no problem. But if a Jew goes in there, they risk their, they risk their lives in a very, very serious, real manner. I hope we're beginning to um, give a different perspective to some of our viewers who may not be aware of what uh, the reality of the facts on the ground are. Well, there you are, viewers. You want to get involved? You want to help Israel here? Get in contact with Naomi Khan, regavim.org. I want to thank you, Naomi. Thank you very much for being on the show here. I hope we've done something that can help you and your organization, because by doing that, 
we get the truth and the evidence to people about what's really going on in Israel here. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you. Thanks for hosting. Uh, my pleasure. And, and <laughs> viewers, um, if you're watching this uh, video, if you found it interesting, don't keep it to yourself. Please share, click the like button, click also subscribe, and you will be receiving future video interviews from The View from Israel. This is Barry Shaw saying thank you very much for your support. I'm not going to